Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar hosted by the Equality Rights Project at Hong Kong U Law. And today we are very thrilled to have uh, Darius Long. Uh, Darius Long Da Rui from uh, Yale University share his research on sexual harassment litigation in China. Uh, Darius is a senior researcher at the Paul Tai China Center at the Yale Law School, and his uh, areas of interest includes equality and non-discrimination issues, uh, in particular employment discrimination and women's rights and uh, sexual harassment and uh, a gender and sexual minority rights. And uh, he, uh, in a, over the past decade, uh, Darius has collaborated with uh, uh, universities and legal scholars and practitioners and uh, civil society advocates in, uh, from the mainland China. And today, Darius will share his recent research uh, titled, uh, how do uh, sexual harassment claims fare in China's courts? And before Darius starts his uh, presentation, uh, there are a few uh, uh, housekeeping matters. And uh, first of all, uh, today's talk will be extended to 10.30 so that we have uh, uh, more uh, time to uh, listen to Darius' present, uh, presentation as this, that is very uh, informative and we will have a uh, uh, more sufficient time to uh, have a discussion with him. And during the presentation, uh, please feel free to type your questions or comments in a chat box and we will collect the, them and pass them to uh, Darius. Uh, uh, either Chinese or English questions are fine. And so uh, without further delay, uh, let's welcome Darius. Now, I think the uh, floor is yours, Darius. Thank you so much, Amika. Thank you so much for inviting me and for organizing everything. Uh, and thank you to everybody who's joining right now. It's um, it's getting late into the evening um, uh, in China, and um, uh, you know, I, thank you for spending your Thursday night um, uh, with us to uh, to discuss this important topic. And uh, please feel no need to stay on until uh, ten thirty. I understand that's very late. I'm a senior fellow at the Paul Tsai China Center uh, at Yale uh, Law School. And um, I work a lot on uh, gender and sexuality related issues and the law. And uh, one uh, sort of focus uh, for me and some of my colleagues is uh, sexual harassment. And um, this uh, presentation that I'm uh, about to give, which I admit is perhaps a little too long and uh, I appreciate your patience, um, is based on an article that uh, my colleagues and I uh, published last year. It's a, it's a short article based on research uh, we did on sexual harassment court judgments um, in China. At that, uh, at that time, you know, there was new um, uh, uh, legislation uh, being passed. The civil code just went into effect earlier that year. Um, and there were some high profile sexual harassment cases that were in the media. And we wanted to explore the question of when do these uh, cases, uh, when do these sexual harassment claims succeed or not succeed in court? And um, so these are the, the, the two main things uh, that uh, sort of our main takeaways from this research. So in, in case it gets too late, you get tired, you wanna log off. If you know these two things and read the article, you'll pretty much know the, the, the main gist of tonight's uh, discussion. So first we found that sexual harassment claims in court generally need to have quote unquote hard evidence, like a, a video recording an or audio recording to have a decent chance of prevailing in court. That is for the judge to support um, uh, the finding that sexual harassment had occurred. And um, uh, we found that uh, often what the case was is that the alleged harasser was suing the alleged survivor. Um, so speaking out about harassment, like publishing a Me Too account online, um, uh, or you know, telling a, a wider group of people about the harassment incident can open you up to being sued for defamation. Or if you're an employer, um, firing the alleged harasser or otherwise disciplining the alleged harasser um, can open you up to litigation because the alleged harasser will then sue you for a legal termination of contract. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the most of tonight's discussion will be about the first point, you know, why is it uh, so difficult for these claims to prevail um, in court. 
And uh, generally, uh, that has to do with um, the burden of proof being on the party making the sexual harassment claims. The standard of proof is quite high, and a court's really disfavor testimony, especially if that testimony is coming from a party in the litigation or, uh, or a witness who has some sort of relationship with the party in the litigation. So um, how did we do this research? What were our parameters? We, um, we looked through uh, several different uh, databases of court judgments, including uh, you know, Peking University's uh, uh, database, uh, Wusong, which is a, a commercial database, and the Supreme People's Court database. And we looked for cases um, that hinged on the question of whether or not sexual harassment occurred. Um, that's, that is that the court uh, had to answer that question in order to come to the judgment. It couldn't just be a side issue. It had to be the main sort of central issue or one of the central issues in the case. We looked for uh, judgments that only occurred between 2018 and 2020. That's th uh, three years. Uh, we chose that time frame because uh, an NGO, the Yuanzhong Gender Development Center, they already had done research on the years 2010 to 2017 and published a report in 2018. So we wanted to do a kind of follow-on project to the research that they did. In the databases that I mentioned, we searched for terms like sexual harassment, harassment, uh, feili, um, which you can say that's also another homonym for harassment or some uh, inappropriate uh, behavior, uh, and we see it like molestation. And we, we found uh, that the case types generally fell into three main categories. Uh, general personality rights cases in which an alleged survivor uh, sues the alleged harasser for sexual harassment. Um, labor disputes, that's when the alleged harasser sues the employer for illegal termination of contract, basically saying, you fired me because you think I'm a harasser. That's not true. I'm not. Um, your, your termination of, of my labor contract has no basis. <clears throat> and defamation cases in which the alleged harasser sues the alleged survivor for uh, having infringed their person, uh, their reputation rights, uh, saying you, you spread false information about me, saying I'm a harasser. Um, uh, and you now owe me compensation or an apology or both. <clears throat> so what did we find? Um, we only found about 83 cases um, where the judgments were available uh, in the databases that fit this, fit this criteria. Um, there were some cases uh, that appeared where uh, the court noted that the two parties had settled out of court. We don't know what happened uh, in those cases. Um, um, uh, and there are some cases where the court says, because this is a very sensitive matter, you know, we're not going to uh, uh, put the full judgment online. Um, but there's only about a, a couple of those uh, kinds of cases. Um, uh, otherwise, we only found 83 uh, full judgments um, uh, that met that criteria. And what we found was that the vast, vast majority, 94%, of the cases were of the alleged harasser uh, initiating the suit, either in a labor dispute against the employer for a legal termination contract, that was 65% uh, of cases, um, or uh, the alleged harasser starting a defamation suit against the uh, alleged survivor for spreading false information. That was 29% of uh, total cases. Only in 6% of cases, that is five cases, uh, did the alleged survivor start a suit against the alleged harasser uh, for, for sexual harassment. Um, and these numbers are slightly different than the article that I just showed you um, because uh, I mistakenly uh, missed a defamation case in the original uh, article. So I had to add that in to the, the defamation category. Um, uh, and in that case, the alleged survivor lost the case. Um, uh, she was successfully sued for defamation. And I had to take out a general personality rights case um, because it involved a suit where uh, the alleged harasser started a suit against the alleged survivor, a defamation suit. 
And then the alleged sur survivor countersued him for sexual harassment. I took that out because I just wanted to have cases depend, I wanted to categorize cases depending on who started the lawsuit, who started the lawsuit, who brought it to court. Um, and this little purple box on the top notes that in 45% of cases, the court believed that the sexual harassment occurred. The sexual harassment claim um, prevailed. Um, <clears throat> um, but just, just, to, just to clarify, that's not saying that in 45% of the cases that some compensation was given to the survivor of sexual harassment. Uh, once again, almost all the cases are the alleged harasser uh, starting the lawsuit. So if the alleged harasser loses that suit, um, they don't lose any money. Um, uh, they just don't get any money. And the other side doesn't get anything either. Maybe some, maybe uh, they get their court fees uh, covered, something like that. Um, so coincidentally, when the Yuanzhong Gender Development Center <clears throat> uh, published their research in 2018, they also did not find many cases in those uh, in that time frame from 2010 to 2017. They found about 30 some odd cases, and only in two of those cases uh, did the alleged survivor sue the alleged harasser for um, for the sexual harassment. Um, and so that's that's a total of six percent of their of their total cases, which is also what we found. We had six percent in our case that as well. Um, so um, uh, our research uh, kind of uh, comports with the previous research. Um, now, at this point, you might be saying, Darius, isn't this like comparing apples and oranges or apples and pomegranates? Because this is uh, the free photo that I found online. Um, basically, that these are three different case types. Um, so how can we compare them together? Because sometimes the alleged survivor is the plaintiff. Sometimes the alleged survivor is the defendant. Doesn't this put the parties in different situations? Um, so they are actually comparable. And let me explain why I think that. So generally speaking, yes, whoever uh, makes the claim in civil lit litigation bears the burden of proof to show that the claim is true. Um, so in general personality rights cases, when the alleged survivor sues the alleged harasser, the alleged survivor is the plaintiff and the alleged survivor uh, carries the burden of proof to show that their claims are true. Um, but things are slightly different in labor disputes. In a labor dispute, um, a, an employee goes to labor arbitration first. Um, and they might make the claim that my contract was terminated illegally. I am now owed compensation. The employee does not have the burden of proof to show that they were fired for an illegitimate reason. On this question, the burden of proof uh, switches to the employer. The employer carries the burden to show that the firing, the termination of the contract, happen for a legitimate reason. They have that burden. So they're kind of, in a, in a sexual harassment case, if an employer fired a harasser for harassment, um, and then the har alleged harasser sues the employer for legal termination of contract, then the employer in labor arbitration, and then maybe later in court, if it's appealed, has to prove that that sexual harassment happened in order for their decision to fire the harasser to be considered legitimate uh, under, under the law. And this, a similar dynamic plays out in defamation cases. So there's no express rule in law or, or, uh, or civil procedure uh, rules saying that the burden of proof is also switched in defamation cases. But that's what courts often do. Courts, um, often uh, when a defamation case is brought for the question of whether or not the defamatory statement is true or not, that falls on the defendant, the person who made the statement. Um, and the argument there is, is that it, it's hard for um, the, uh, the plaintiff in that case to prove that something did not happen. 
uh, it's easier for the defendant to prove that something did happen. It's easier to prove a positive rather than a negative. Um, and this is consistent with many jurisdictions uh, around the world. In defamation cases, the burden of proof falls on the defendant. The person made the the person who allegedly made the defamatory statement to show that their statement was true. There's, all, there's only a handful of exceptions uh, to, to this um, uh, you know, general uh, norm. Um, uh, and, and the US is one of them, um, uh, but hasn't always been. So, and that's a whole other uh, PowerPoint. Uh, so, but the point, the main point here is that in all three of these cases, the party making uh, the claim of sexual harassment, they carry the burden of proof to show that the harassment happened. So we're, we'll make a list of the challenges that uh, the party making the se sexual harassment claim in court faces. And the first uh, uh, on this list is the burden of proof. They carry the burden of proof. So how difficult is it to carry this burden of proof? How high do you have to climb? And how steep is that climb? Is it like the mountain on the left or is it like the mountain on the right? Just exactly how, how difficult it is. So, so now we're gonna talk about not just the burden of proof, but the standard of proof. And um, I'm not sure, I'm gonna get the chat box up. I, I'm sure this is a very law crowd. Does anybody know? Oh, actually I just gave it away in this PowerPoint. Um, I was gonna ask if anybody knew what the civil standard of proof is in China. Um, but the answer is right here. It is a high degree of likelihood. So let's get into what that, uh, what that means exactly. So uh, in China, in civil litigation, the party that carries the burden of proof needs to um, convince the court uh, that the fact that they are asserting occurred to a high degree of likelihood. Um, so how high exactly is that? I found this article in uh, Procurator Daily to, uh, to be a useful explanation of what that standard means. So uh, first let's talk about what the standard is not. This standard is not like the common law, that is the US and uh, English common law standard of the preponderance of the evidence. In preponderance of the, of the evidence, the question is just, who do you believe more? What side do you believe more? Even if the two sides are, the, the persuasiveness of their evidence is very, very similar. Um, imagine two scales of justice or a scale of justice and the two sides are even, but then a little bit more evidence is added to one side and that side becomes heavier, even if just by a little bit, the court can find that that fact occurred. It is a relative concept. What side do you believe more? But in civil law jurisdictions, including China um, and many other jurisdictions around the world, Japan, South Korea, Germany, France, the, the civil standard is, um, is higher. Uh, and in this article, the author explains, and this author is a, a procurator, um, that uh, the civil standard proof in China is higher. The persuasiveness of the evidence of one side needs to far exceed the persuasiveness of evidence on the other side in order for the judge to believe, um, for the court to believe the facts being alleged. So it's not just a smidge of a difference, it's a much larger difference. And um, I'm not saying this is, is, is better or worse, this is a huge question uh, in comparing common law systems with civil law systems. Common law systems have juries, juries are very unpredictable. Um, uh, th there's, there's lots of things to talk about in terms of why put the civil standard proof here or here. Um, but we'll have to leave that aside today I'm just trying to list what are the uh, circumstances that people find themselves in in civil litigation in China when sexual harassment comes up. So this is the civil standard of proof. Some people have tried to put a number on this uh, level of probability. Um, uh, uh, Professor Hua here says 85% at least 
other people say 75%. Um, it's really hard to have an exact mathematical explanation or description of this. Um, but I'm sharing it just to convey the message that it is higher than the preponderance of the evidence standard in uh, US and, and English uh, law. And the, the civil standard of proof in China, uh, you know, it sounds a lot like other standards of proof in civil jurisdiction, civil law jurisdictions around the world. Here, uh, the German Federal Supreme Court described the civil standard of proof in Germany as being when uh, the judge may and must be content with a degree of certainty useful for practical life that silences doubt without completely excluding it. And um, I just want to focus on the last couple of words there. Um, the exclusion of doubt is often a standard you hear in criminal law. In the US, you say beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, in China, uh, in, the, in the, the criminal standard of proof, there is this uh, language about excluding a reasonable doubt. Um, so with the civil standard of proof in Germany is saying, it's not quite as high as the criminal standard. And that is also true in China. The civil standard of proof is, is, might be high, but it is not as high as the criminal standard of proof. Um, so we just that just helps us kind of locate where, where the civil standard of proof is. Um, it's not uh, you know, beyond reasonable doubt or excluding a reasonable doubt. However, sometimes the criminal standard like sneaks into civil litigation. Uh, and that happened uh, in, in a couple of the cases that we found. Um, so for example, in this very high profile case uh, involving uh, uh, a sexual harassment claim made against uh, Dongfei, who is a media and NGO figure, um, the court in its judgment, judgment said that the defendant and there are two defendants here, the, the, uh, the survivor who wrote the account of being sexually harassed that was published online, and the other defendant um, helped her publish it online. <clears throat> uh, the court says that the, uh, the facts presented by the defendants um, does not lead to uh, you know, the court having a, a sort of doubtless confidence, a confidence that is, doesn't have any doubt. And the lawyers of the alleged survivor later appealed this case and said, um, this is a misapplication of the standard of proof. This is, uh, the court here used the civil, sorry, the court here used the criminal standard of proof, did not use the civil standard of proof. Um, I, I think they are right. Uh, I, think they, I think they're right in making that argument, but um, they lost on appeal. Um, and there are some other cases uh, later on that we will get into that show how this criminal standard sometimes sneaks into the civil litigation. Okay, so that brings us back to uh, why, uh, you know, this helps explain why we see this disparity where, you know, almost in all cases, 94% of cases, the alleged harasser is bringing in the lawsuit. They're confident that enough to, uh, in their claim, will succeed that they will go to court and file a case. Whereas we only see that in five instances for the alleged survivor going to court. Um, that's because uh, already with, just with these two challenges, we see that the climb is very, very steep, is the larger mountain. And the party making the sexual harassment claims, that's the party on the bottom beginning the climb, they have to travel the whole way up. Whereas the party who the claims were made against, the alleged harasser, they don't have to do much. They can sort of just deny, deny, deny. They can sort of like roll rocks down the hill. And if the other party doesn't make it up to the top, the alleged harasser wins. They're in a much sort of better uh, position than the alleged survivor is, even with just these two uh, challenges noted. And that brings us to the next challenge, which is that testimony is highly disfavored and often discounted in litigation involving sexual harassment claims. Uh, and actually, it's, this is probably true in, in, in general, um, but in the, in the court cases we found, um, testimony is highly, highly disfavored. So we, um, uh, so this is the main chart of tonight. This is uh, the sort of main finding to walk away with um, to prove the point that I mentioned earlier about hard evidence. Sexual harassment claims really need 
hard evidence. <clears throat> um, so we try to um, categorize all the cases we found um, by what kind of evidence did the court focus on the most to, to determine their finding, to, to, make, to make their decision. Um, and the, uh, the, I'll go through them one by one, and you can sort of see the slope of you know most convincing to uh, to least convincing. The the light purple is when the sexual harassment claim uh, was believed by the court, and the darker purple um, is when it was not believed by the court. So the thing most convincing to courts is if the police detained the alleged harasser. The courts um, make <clears throat> the courts are basically saying. If it's good enough for the police to have arrested this person, detained them, even if it's just administrative detention, um, then it's good enough for us. So in the top category, in all eight of those cases where the police detained uh, alleged harasser or harasser, um, the court also said, we believe the sexual harassment happened. And in all eight of those cases, that's the only evidence they, the court cites. They say the, the police made a decision Thus, the harassment happened. The next most convincing um, uh, for courts was when the alleged harasser, in some sort of formal context, admitted to the behavior. And you might think, wow, that's strange. The alleged harasser admitted to the behavior. Um, and, and then in, in many cases, they later sued, saying that, that the, it didn't happen. And yes, that is, that is it sort of it puts you in a very bad position. Uh, if the alleged harasser in a very bad position to do that. Um, in these cases, either the alleged harasser in a police interrogation, uh, you know, set, admitted to some of the behavior that uh, that they are accused of, or when they're being fired from their job, the employer might make them sign a statement about why they're being fired and list out the facts regarding the sexual harassment that occurred. And they might put their name to that statement and then that statement will later be presented in court. Um, the alleged harasser in court might later say, oh, I didn't mean it. Um, I didn't understand what I was signing. Um, or they might say, yes, that behavior happened, but that behavior is not bad enough to constitute sexual harassment. It was just a joke, or it was just um, a misunderstanding. Um, and, uh, and sometimes uh, the court will support that argument. And that happened in one case, which is the little dark purple bar at the end of this uh, uh, bar here. Uh, and now we get to the interesting part, where things get a little bit more fuzzy. Uh, the, the next most convincing kind of evidence was um, recordings. That is like a, a video recording or um, or like a uh, a um, an audio uh, sorry an audio recording or like screenshots of of what happened uh, like the like offending text messages um, those uh, <clears throat> uh, those cases were about 50 50. there are 22 cases where that kind of evidence was present and the court really focused on it um, but it fell into 50 50. sometimes if the recording is good enough clear enough it directly depicts what's going on, or there are screenshots from very offensive text messages, um, like stalking kind of text, mess text messages, um, the court will support, uh, but they will believe the claim of sexual harassment. But if the evidence is it's fuzzy, it doesn't directly depict what is happening, uh, then the claim of sexual harassment has much less of a chance of being believed. Um, then we get into the evidence that doesn't do very well. Uh, and these middle two sections are um, what I call, he said, they said, and he said, she said. So he said, they said is when it's the word of the alleged harasser versus the word of the alleged survivor or survivors, plus perhaps with other witnesses. Um, so in, in those cases, those, those also don't do um, uh, terribly well. They only succeed in about a, a quarter of the time. Um, and <clears throat> uh, we'll get into the reasons why and why not, when they do and when they do not succeed uh, in a bit. 
Then in he said, she said cases, um, that's the word of the alleged harasser versus the word of the alleged survivor. Um, those only succeeded in two out of 12 cases. So less than a fifth of the time. Um, it, you know, that those, they have a very low chance of, of success. And we'll, and even then, I, 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 later we'll, I'll, we'll discuss uh, one of these cases in more detail. Um, uh, I'm not even sure if we should categorize that case as a he said, she said case. So the, this rate of success might even be worse than what it is here. Um, uh, now again to the um, kinds of evidence that um, the court, uh, if they see it, they, they most likely be like, no, the sexual harassment claim did, did not, happen. we don't believe it. So that's, that's in, so the, the next category is hearsay evidence. Um, that is, uh, you know, somebody told me that this happened. <laughs> um, that uh, never succeeded. And in all eight cases, those involved a labor dispute where the employer fires the alleged harasser. But then when they show up in court, they don't present any witnesses. They don't present any written statements. Uh, they just say, uh, judge, you know, this is what we heard. This is why we did it. Uh, this is why we fired the uh, alleged harasser. And they, they lost in every case. The judge did not find that convincing, um, uh, not surprisingly. Um, then there are cases where uh, um, police start an investigation, um, but then either formally decide or just, or informally never follow up <laughs> um, and don't, do not detain the alleged harasser. And in three, in three cases, the court only cites the police action and says, well, if the police did not detain the alleged harasser, then the sexual harassment claim didn't happen. We don't believe it. Um, and I'll get, we'll talk later about why that is problematic. Uh, why, why kind of deferring to the police is problematic because the police are doing a different job. They're doing, they're looking into, did a crime happen? Did a violation of public order happen? And those things are different than sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is a civil concept. Um, uh, you know, police have a different job than uh, a civil court does. So deferring to the police um, is problematic and we'll get more into detail on that later. Uh, and then in one case, uh, there is a confession by the alleged survivor that their allegation was false. This involved, involved a very like minor commercial dispute between uh, a woman and a man. And uh, she uh, published a video of her uh, making a sexual harassment allegation against the man, but she later uh, confessed that that was false. And obviously in that case, the court will um, say, we don't believe the sexual harassment claim uh, occurred. Um, so uh, we're gonna get into uh, these different case categories and some case examples later on. Um, but first I just wanna kind of show how this distributes when it comes to each case category. So first, let's take uh, defamation cases. Uh, there are 24 of them, um, and sexual harassment claims only prevailed in 25% of the defamation cases. Um, and you can see that's, that's because in defamation cases, the evidence that was available are he said, she said evidence, or he said, they said evidence most of the time. That's in 59% you know, of the cases, it's testimony. He said, they, he said, she said, he said, they said. Out of all these 59% the of cases, um, only one of them, uh, six, only one of them, the court believed that sexual harassment claim happened. I just think it's interesting that in defamation cases, um, um, there's mostly, uh, this is the kind of testimony that is, that is available. Um, uh, this kind of makes sense because a point I, I should have raised earlier is that um, sexual harassment occurs often in spaces where there are not a lot of other witnesses. Um, you know, somebody who intends to harass somebody or sexually assault somebody or accost somebody or hopes to you know, pressure them into sex um, will uh, try to find a, uh, a circumstance in which there aren't other people around. So this could happen um, you know, in a hotel room on a business trip. This is a kind of typical kind of case. Uh, or in a storage room in a factory where there aren't other people around. Um, 
uh, a dressing room. This happened in the case against Zhu Jun. Um, the alleged harassment, uh, assault, sexual assault happened in a, um, a, a, a dressing room. So the, there is not uh, you know, cameras readily available uh, to directly depict what is happening in a hotel room. Um, and there aren't other uh, people around a lot of the time. Um, so uh, in, in defamation cases where the alleged harasser is bringing the suit, um, it, it makes sense that we see often the main testimony available is that of, uh, of testimony. One person's word or a couple people's word against another person's word. When it comes to labor cases, the kinds of evidence available is a little bit more evenly distributed. And that kind of makes sense um, because it, in, sexual, sorry, in labor disputes, sexual harassment claims um, um, are believed by the court about half of the time. And uh, in these kinds of cases, we see more um, uh, more he said, they said uh, testimony. So there's more people involved. Um, the police <clears throat> uh, get involved more and there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, audio visual recording evidence. And then in general personality rights cases, which um, is the alleged survivor suing the alleged harasser, um, we see that these cases only really occur if there's some hard evidence available. So, um, uh, so in three of these cases, also there's only a tiny amount of cases compared to, that's why I made the pie chart very small to get this point across. There's only a few of these cases. If the police, uh, so in 60% of these cases, the police detain the alleged harasser. So if you go to civil court after that, making a sexual harassment claim, you have like slam dunk evidence. The court is, almost 100% likely to believe that the sexual harassment claim happened. And the other 40% of cases, it was a recording. It was like screenshots um, uh, of, the, uh, of the offending text messages uh, or, or the alleged harasser apologizing for the harassment via text messages. You know, uh, very hard evidence for the court to look at, not just on testimony. Um, so why, so let's get into reasons why we see the slope. Why do the he said, they said, and he said, she said categories do so poorly? What are the reasons for this? Why do courts not like testimony? Um, well, first, there's actually a rule that says they cannot establish a court, cannot find that a fact is true if the only basis for that fact is the statement of one of the parties. This also applies for witnesses who have some sort of interest relationship with one of the parties. So in a he said, she said case, one person's word against another's, even if the court believes the story of the survivor, they think the survivor's story is more credible, even in that circumstance. This rule seems to say you cannot find the fact of sexual harassment as true if that is the only evidence available. Um, so, uh, you know, in a case in a hotel room, no cameras, uh, you know, the alleged harasser didn't send any text messages, um, and there's a, an assault, sexual assault that occurred in that hotel room it becomes a question of one person's word against another. And this rule seems to say that um, for the party bearing the burden of proof that you can't establish um, the fact of sexual harassment, even if you believe their story. Uh, and the same goes for witnesses um, uh, who have an interest relationship with the party. And this often comes up in labor disputes um, because when the harassment happens in a work context, the witnesses are often colleagues of the survivor. That, that is, they, they work for the same company. And the party in a labor dispute is the employer. The employer is being um, sued uh, by the uh, alleged harasser. And the court might say, well, um, the witnesses here are employees of the employer. They have an interest relationship. Thus, their, their testimony is basically the same thing as a party statement. And that really reduces the credibility of the testimony of those witnesses. 
Um, this really great book, Embedded Courts, Traditional Decision-Making in China, um, also gets into why testimony is not very believed. Um, uh, so the authors say, most judges view uncorroborated oral evidence as useless because they, they really don't believe, <laughs> they have very low trust towards the, uh, the parties that, uh, and, the, and the evidence that they present. And you, know, you should be skeptical as a judge, um, but the, the problem really is that judges are under so much time pressure because uh, they have really high caseloads um, that they don't have time to go into, um, uh, you know, to allow uh, the lawyers to do cross-examination, to give their own questions, to really, uh, you know, interrogate the witnesses and the parties to see what side they believe more. They don't have time for that. So they, they're really looking for hard evidence that it will allow the party with the burden of proof to meet the standard of proof. And if they don't have that, then they can just, the judge will just say, there's not enough evidence here and move on to the next case. Um, there's also you know, you know, institutional reasons for that besides time pressure. The judges don't wanna be overturned on appeal. Um, and so they feel the best way to safeguard against being overturned is to only make a decision in favor of the party with the burden of proof when there is hard evidence. So the intermediate court would also be convinced by um, the judgment. Uh, if they just, if the if the court just looks at testimony and they say, well, you know, when I was there in person, I really believed what that uh, party was saying. The intermediate court um, uh, might not have the same interpretation. Um, um, so that's another reason why uh, there, there might be cautious uh, uh, to you know, believe or you know, base their judgment on testimony. So um, not only uh, does the steepness look like this, but if you don't have that hard evidence, like a vi video recording, an audio recording, then the climb looks less like this and more like this, you have a really, really steep climb uh, without that hard kinds of evidence. Um, it may not be impossible, but um, you are likely to fail. Um, so now we're gonna look at each of these evidence types, uh, look at specific case examples and show the dynamics at play uh, in each of them. And um, I, I tended to choose like one representative case and then one sort of exceptional case that shows how things could be done a little differently um, um, to, to sort of compare how different courts um, uh, approach these questions. So first let's, let's start with the um, least persuasive evidence to courts. Uh, that is, he said, she said, one person's word against another's. So I, I chose this uh, defamation case. That I think it's pretty representative because um, in, all the all nine defamation defamation cases where it was he said she said they, they all lost. So in in this particular case, a female employee uh, sent a word document to um, um, sent a word document to a WeChat group of her colleagues, and in that word document, she talked about the harassment that she suffered at the hands of a male colleague. And in the most serious example of this harassment, she said that the male colleague uh, you know, made her go to dinner with her, um, made her go to dinner with him and tried to force her to drink. And later when they were returning to a staff dormitory, he forcibly uh, accosted her uh, and, tried to, and was touching her and also exposed his uh, genitals to her. The male employee then called the police saying that um, false accusations were being made against him. The police uh, went to go talk to the female employee and they, they warned her, unless you have conclusive proof, do not post any accusations. Um, 
And then the female employee uh, uh, backed down, agreed. And it's kind of intimidating if the police show up and tell you this. And then she was sued by the male employee in court for defamation. And the court sided with the male employee. The court said, um, without evidence, uh, we cannot believe that the female employee's claims are true. So she loses the case. Um, and later we'll talk about the role of police in these cases. Even when there's not a formal decision made, um, they can sort of sway uh, what happens uh, in the case. And we'll talk about that uh, later on. So that this, I think this is kind of representative of, uh, of the he said, she said cases. They, when it's just one person's word against another, the alleged survivor tends to lose. Let's look at uh, an exception. This is a, uh, this is a uh, labor dispute um, in which that, that happened uh, in, a, in a factory um, uh, that involved an alleged incident of harassment in a storage room uh, where there wasn't other people. So in this case, um, the police are called uh, again by a female employee who says that she had been um, molested uh, in a storage room. The, the male employee, when, uh, and it's unclear exactly where he confesses this, um, but <clears throat> at court, he says, yes, we were in the storage room together, but in the storage room, no sexual harassment happened. I just asked the female employee for a loan back. The male employee says that he had lent 400 quai to the female employee. Um, he wanted it back. And she said no. And then later on, she brought this, uh, he claims a false allegation of sexual harassment against her, sorry, against him, in order to get out of repaying the loan. Um, that was his explanation of what happened. Um, so this is a he said, uh, on these facts, this is a he said, she said case, one person's uh, story against another's. And the court uh, said, you know, this sounds strange. <laughs> this goes against common sense. The, the loan is only for 400 quai. Why would the female employee risk her job, risk, uh, you know, legal liability? You know, she's bringing a false claim against a male colleague. Um, uh, they also mentioned why would she risk a relationship uh, with her, her boyfriend, because uh, I think the, the court is saying that um, if she had been sexually harassed and, uh, and she makes that allegation, that might influence her reputation or something. Uh, in short, uh, there are a lot of risks to making this claim of sexual harassment. Why do all this only to get out of a 400 quai loan? It doesn't make sense. So we believe the sexual harassment occurred. The court says that the um, uh, sexual harassment uh, uh, occurred. Um, I'm not 100% confident though, this is a he said, she said case, uh, because the court in passing mentions that the police did gather some other evidence such as um, like security camera footage. There's no camera footage of what happened in the storage room. But maybe, uh, but maybe um, there was security camera footage of them going into the storage room. I don't know, the, the judgment doesn't say, but I just wondered in this case, why did the male employee admit to being in the storage room with the female employee? Um, because after you had, he admitted that, he, ha he had to explain why they were in the room together and he came up with this loan story, the story about that he wanted money back. Um, it could be, I don't know, it's because it's not in the judgment. Uh, it could be that other evidence like security camera footage established the fact that he was in the storage room with the female employee. And at that point, he has to make up a kind of unbelievable story. So this might not actually be a he said, she said case, which would further prove that he said, she said cases uh, don't do very well. So let's move on to the next uh, kind of evidence, which is he said, they said, which does a little bit better. Um, so he said, 
uh, they said cases uh, uh, also run into problems. Um, so for example, in this labor dispute um, where a, um, a, a male employee had several complaints of sexual harassment made against him, um, uh, he was fired. And then, the, uh, and then he brought his company to labor arbitration. And at labor arbitration, um, the company brought in uh, witnesses to say, you know, we um, wrote the complaints against this male employer and, and these written statements are true. We experienced the harassment at the hands of the male employee. Um, but uh, the labor arbitration um, agreed with the male employee so that you were illegally terminated and thus you're owed compensation. Then the company appealed this labor arbitration decision and went to civil court. And the, the court agreed with the arbitration uh, results saying that the, the two witnesses brought to, they also appeared at trial at the civil court. The witnesses, um, they are employees of the plaintiff. They are employees of the company. Uh, thus, they have um, a, a a interest relationship with the employer. So they're basically the equivalent of a party statement. Uh, they, they, are, they are not very credible witnesses. So we have no way of confirming um, if what they said is true. Thus, there's no evidence that the termination of the contract is legitimate. And the court ordered the employer to pay the male employee 52,000 yuan um, uh, for a legal termination contract. A lot of money compared to when an alleged survivor sues an alleged harasser. Um, that amount of money is usually much smaller than this. Uh, this case is interesting because it shows when um, this obstacle can be overcome. Um, uh, so in, in this case, this involves a lifeguard who uh, worked at a pool um, and uh, was accused of often sexually harassing colleagues and uh, often uh, kind of uh, walking into the women's um, locker room and shower room um, to, to peep. Um, uh, this, um, this lifeguard was fired after complaints were made. And then he brought a labor dispute for a legal termination of contract against, uh, against the employer. Um, and the, the first instance court said, um, we believe the male employee. We don't believe the sexual harassment claims um, because the witnesses who are presented here, um, most of them are colleagues of the male employee. They are employees of the, of the company. So they are in the same position as the party. They don't have a lot of credibility. Um, um, so we do not uh, support the, uh, the allegation of sexual harassment and we believe that the termination of his contract was illegal. Um, also, it does, I don't say it here, uh, but um, somewhere else, they note that a written statement, a written complaint was made against a male employee, but the person who wrote that complaint did not show up in court. So the, the judge, uh, um, the judge said, we, we, we do not believe this written complaint of sexual harassment. Um, but on appeal, the intermediate court took a different view. The intermediate court um, said that we, uh, we A, you know, there's different kinds of employees uh, who made this claim, there's a bunch of them, and it, their witness testimony matches the written complaint by one of the, um, the residents in the building where this pool was. And those two things corroborate each other. Um, uh, so even though uh, the, the, the person who wrote that complaint did not show up in court, that shows that um, the witness testimony of the colleagues is more believable. 
So we actually think that the sexual harassment behavior occurred. And I've seen other cases um, where this presumption against the testimony of, uh, of the employees um, is overcome by just sheer numbers. In one case, there were seven witnesses um, um, who all witnessed the, the harassing behavior. It happened at a, at a big dinner. Um, they, uh, the court believed uh, that the sexual harassment occurred because there were so many witnesses in that case. So uh, they, they didn't dismiss them just because they were employees of the employer. So let's continue our way up uh, the chart to more and more persuasive kinds of evidence. Uh, let's look at recordings, audio recordings, video recordings, screenshots. Um, uh, these kinds of cases, so let me just go back for a second. So like I said earlier, these kinds of cases have a high chance of success when they are clear and direct. They, they clearly depict uh, the sexual harassment behavior occurring. Um, and they, they do less well when they don't depict that. Um, they're also very interesting because these cases um, don't just depend on establishing if whether a certain kind of behavior happened, they also depend on the interpretation of that behavior. What did it mean? Was it, was it bad enough to constitute sexual harassment? And courts can be very different um, on this question because it really depends on the sort of worldview of the judge. There could de depend on their understandings of, of gender dynamics, of, um, uh, of lots of different things. Um, uh, uh, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. And we're taking an example of one of the worst examples. Um, <clears throat> so th this is an example where there's some clear uh, evidence of what happened, but the court um, um, interprets it in its own way. Um, so in this case, uh, a female employee accuses a supervisor of sexual harassment. Uh, she says there are several different incidences of harassment, um, and she provides a picture of the supervisor uh, uh, sleeping on her thigh uh, in a car ride. Um, she also provides screenshots of the supervisor via text messages asking, um, asking uh, her to sleep with the client, to have sex with the client. Um, so the, in response, the, the supervisor, the male supervisor says, I don't remember sleeping on your thigh. I was very, very drunk. I, I believe it was after like a business dinner on a business trip. I was very, very drunk. I don't remember that. I just fell asleep. I just passed out. Um, and, uh, the text message, you know, there's a misunderstanding about that. That's not what I meant. And the court uh, seems to believe the supervisor, or at least you know, sides with the supervisor. The court says um, the picture of him asleep on the female employee's thigh is not sufficient to establish that it was intentional sexual harassment. He was drunk, he doesn't remember. It's not intentional, not his fault. Um, and then as for the WeChat record of what he said to her, the court um, says that his language was inappropriate, but it did not amount to the, the degree of, of sexual harassment. Um, so the court doesn't spell out here saying that um, asking an employee to have sex with a client is not sexual harassment. We, we, don't, we, we, don't, no, we, don't, we don't have the exact language of the screenshot in the judgment, um, but the court seems to be saying, we, we, you know, it was inappropriate what happened, but it's not bad enough for this uh, male employee to be fired legitimately. Um, and then the court ordered the company to pay the male supervisor almost 360,000 renminbi in compensation, which is, seems like a lot of money um, uh, compared to the, the, uh, the money that we find, find in the general personality rights cases. It's, it's really, um, it's, it's a lot of money. So if you, so if you are a company, uh, if you think like a company and uh, an employee makes an allegation of sexual harassment, um, uh, the company might be incentivized uh, to not do anything about it because if they do something about it, if they, 
investigate and then fire uh, the alleged harasser, they might have to pay a decent amount of money in compensation if they don't have really hard evidence. Okay, let's now, uh, we're, we're heading towards the end. Uh, we are now going to the last uh, category of evidence that we'll be discussing tonight, um, which is what happens when the police get involved. So in 11 cases, the police action was the only thing that was cited. Um, if the police detained the alleged harasser, the court just cites that, and that's sort of the end of the discussion. That's good enough for the court. And then, and that makes sense because if the police are harassing, uh, sorry, if the police are detaining the alleged harasser, um, the police are trying to meet a higher standard than than a civil court is trying to meet. Um, so, uh, so it makes sense that the court could defer to the police on, on a formal decision to detain. Um, uh, what makes less sense is when the police don't detain the alleged harasser and the court says, okay, this means that the, the sexual harassment claim did not happen. Um, because like I said earlier, the police are doing a different job. Uh, they're enforcing criminal law or, or public order violations. They're not making determinations about civil law rights. That's the court's job. So the court should really defer to the police in these situations. But it seems like the uh, police actions one way or the other do have an influence on courts. Um, so we counted 28 cases out of the 83 cases where the court, sorry, where, where the police start an investigation. And uh, the results or lack of results in those investigations seem to have a, an influence on what the court decides. Um, uh, so like I said earlier, eight out of eight cases, police formally detained the alleged harasser, the court would believe that sexual harassment happened. Um, but if you have a formal decision by the police not to detain the harasser, that is they actually issue like a written decision uh, saying we, we, we did not find a violation occurred. Then in almost uh, all instances, uh, in seven out of eight of, uh, of those kinds of cases, the court will say, we don't believe the sexual harassment uh, behavior happened. Uh, there's one exception to this, and we will discuss that uh, later on. Um, if the police start an uh, investigation, um, but don't have a formal conclusion to that investigation, then it kind of is 50-50. It's kind of, with the court will look at other evidence and it, and it falls different ways depending on what evidence is available. So, um, why is this problematic? Um, and I think this case helps explain why this is, is a problematic, uh, you know, deferring to police is, is problematic. Um, in this case, uh, a female employee at a hotel um, is sexually harassed by a male employee. He uh, fondles her backside. Um, the police are, are called and uh, they find that no act of molestation, um, no crime occurred and no violation of public order occurred. However, the police um, so, sort of you know, give the male employee a talking to. Um, it says, you know, give him some legal education. They, they say like, you know, I, I don't know if they think the harassment happened or not, but they gave the male employee a talking to. And the court says, um, because the, um, the uh, police did not find that a crime occurred or that a, a violation of public order occurred, um, so the employer did not, cannot meet its burden of proof um, that the sexual harassment occurred. Um, uh, so this is problematic because the police aren't saying that the act of touching the female's rear end did not occur. The police are just saying, we did not find that a crime occurred, a criminal act occurred or a public order violation occurred. It, did, it didn't get that serious. Um, 
but is touching the rear end of a uh, female employee count as sexual harassment for the purposes of uh, this company firing the male employee, that's a different question. That's a, that's a question for the civil court. Um, but the court here seems to say, uh, we're going with, with what the police said, and we're not going to look into uh, other, other um, evidence. Um, so that, that's, we're going to add that to the list of challenges for parties making sexual harassment claims. Um, now I'm going to show you uh, courts that don't defer to the police and how they reason. Because um, I think this is, this is good. This is what courts should be doing uh, in these following cases. Um, so in, in this case, another labor dispute um, where a male employee uh, is accused of sexually harassing um, uh, female em employees, um, they never mention the specific sexual harassment behavior that happened um, in, the, uh, in this case. Uh, there's just some like indirect references uh, to what it could be. Um, so <clears throat> in this case, the police get involved, but they, they do not de determine that the act um, amounted to a crime or amounted to a public order violation. And the male employee says, look, the police didn't detain me, so I should not have been fired uh, for sexual harassment. Um, but the court says, um, actually, uh, no, you admitted, the male employee admitted, um, I believe he admitted this in, in talking with the police, uh, that some of his actions, his, some of the things he said, and some of the messages that he sent, uh, like the pictures that he sent, were inappropriate um, and, and very sensitive. And um, he admitted to those facts. And that behavior, is a form of sexual harassment that violated the company policy of not uh, sexually harassing colleagues. So the employer's decision to fire the male employee was legitimate. It's a separate question from what the police decision was. Uh, and this also occurred in the uh, storage room case that we mentioned earlier, the he said, she said case involving the harassment in the storage room where the male employee said that um, the female employee owed me 400 kwai, um, but the court did not believe the male employee. In that case, um, that male employee also made this argument that, look, the police got involved, but they did not detain me. So the police determined that the sexual harassment did not occur. And the court uh, at, at every level, because this went up, uh, twice, the, the 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 trial, the local court said, um, no, these are two different questions. In a civil proceeding, our standard of proof is high degree of likelihood. That is different than the higher criminal standard of proof. So the question we're asking is different ultimately than the, the questions that the police are asking. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So. Uh, the question we're asking is whether or not the behavior of the male employee violated company policy and had a negative effect on, uh, on the female employee and on the company, uh, enough to justify the company firing the male employee. And they say, you would, you, we, think, we think it's bad enough. It violates company policy. Uh, it is sexual harassment. Thus, firing the male employee was legitimate. Okay, so those are the, the general, the, there were 83 cases, there are many different kinds of situations that happened, but those, those give you an idea of what kinds of cases, how they occurred, what kinds of evidence was available, and what kind of um, uh, decisions courts come to depending on what kind of evidence was available. So um, how can we make the, the sort of the steep climb a little more fair for the party who's making the sexual harassment claim? Because right now it seems, very, very difficult unless you have hard, hard evidence. And that often isn't available in sexual harassment uh, incidents because the harasser is often looking for a situation um, in which um, uh, the two parties are alone. Um, and you know, I, I just want to note that um, and, and out of 83 cases, 94% of the time, 
it's the alleged harasser bringing the case. And only 6% of the time, it's the alleged survivor bringing the case. So um, in the 94% of cases where there's some sort of sexual harassment claim being made, um, the alleged survivors are not going to court. Um, they're just reporting it to the company, speaking out online. Um, they don't have the confidence to go to court uh, to bring the case because they know how hard it is to win. Um, so what can we do to make it more fair? So the first, I think, most obvious thing, um, uh, like what the two courts I just mentioned said, is that courts should use definitions and standards that are in civil law, not criminal law. That is, use the high degree of likelihood standard and not use the criminal law standard, which you know, uses uh, phrases like excluding a, a reasonable doubt. That's too high for, for civil law. It should be high degree of likelihood standard, which is um, around that 75%, 85% benchmark. Also, civil law courts should use definitions that exist in civil law. Um, criminal law does not have the word sexual harassment in it. Um, uh, public order violations don't have sexual harassment in it. Um, sexual harassment is a civil law concept. Um, if you look at the civil code, which is now in effect, uh, it wasn't in effect um, when these uh, cases were heard, um, but there are plenty of provincial and local regulations that did give definitions or describe what sexual harassment is at that time. They describe sexual harassment as uh, you know, a behavior, whether it's physical or through language or through text messages that um, uh, go against another person's will and have a sexual sort of connotation to them. That's a much broader definition uh, than what's in the criminal law. Um, so we should use the definitions that are in civil law. Um, also in, 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 in labor disputes, um, company policy might just say, you can be fired for inappropriate behavior. It did not even use the word sexual harassment. Um, it's about whether or not you were showing respect um, um, and uh, behave appropriately towards uh, one's colleagues and whether or not you violate a company policy. And that's the inquiry. Uh, and that's an even broader concept than uh, the civil code's uh, description of sexual harassment. The next uh, suggestion is hard. It's much harder. Uh, that is, courts should weigh the credibility of testimony and not dismiss it automatically because of the witness's identity, saying, oh, you're a party to the case, thus we can't believe anything you say, or oh, you're an employee of the, of the company in the case, so we can't believe what you're saying. Courts should uh, really look at, are these two stories believable? Which story is more believable? Um, uh, and we get, and we, courts, the, it'd be great if the Supreme Court's court could remove the rule that courts should just automatically dismiss the um, statement of, uh, of, of the party if that's the only evidence available. Um, however, I understand that that could be, um, this could be difficult because the courts need mechanisms to effectively compel parties to show up in court. Often parties just don't show up in court and the court doesn't, you know, technically they can do this, but they often don't compel uh, a party to show up to testify. Um, and there are other, uh, there are other um, pressures like time pressure. They don't have time to go through all the testimony and weigh the credibility. They're worried about being appealed. Uh, these are all kind of big institutional reasons that require big institutional changes and restructuring in order to um, uh, give judges the incentive to want to weigh the credibility of the party's testimony. So I recognize that this is a problem. Um, and uh, I just want to note that I'm not the only person who is like talking about this. There are scholars in China um, um, who note, uh, this is a scholar from uh, Xinan Zhengfa, who, um, <clears throat> who said that, you know, just automatically excluding party statement, if that's the only evidence available, um, this violates the principle of the free evaluation of evidence. Um, or, you know, it, it suspiciously looks close to violating that 
that principle. Um, uh, the judge should be free to evaluate what they think is more credible and less credible. Um, uh, it's also very unfair to the party making the claim that if they just don't happen to have a camera around or a phone to, to record what's going on, um, you know, they're likely to, to lose. And, um, you know, and that, that often is the case in sexual harassment cases. So to be more fair to the parties, courts should be allowed to believe the statements of uh, one of the parties making the claim um, if they really find their story to be more credible. Much in the same way that that court did in the case we looked at involving the sexual harassment that occurred in the storage room in the factory. They said, we don't believe this story about the loan. Um, uh, it seems like you made this story up. It's, it's too outlandish. Um, so what else can be done? Uh, this, these suggestions are less about what happens in litigation and more about um, uh, outside litigation, what can happen. To, to sort of change the dynamic. So first, I, the law should incentivize organizations to adopt robust anti-sexual harassment systems. So there are, you know, going back a long time uh, uh, in, in provincial um, uh, regulations, there is some language saying that, you know, companies uh, should prevent sexual harassment. Um, they should adopt some mechanisms to prevent sexual harassment. Um, the civil code, uh, which went into effect last year, says that companies have an obligation to prevent, investigate, and respond to sexual harassment. Um, but it seems like most companies don't have these systems in place. Um, when last year, when the Alibaba sexual assault incident happened, um, the, uh, the female employee in that case uh, she, she first uh, went to different managers in the company to say, on a business trip, I was sexually assaulted by a supervisor and by a client. Um, but for, for several days, it seems like she got um, the runaround, as in uh, like she just like they, 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 got kicked, kicked around. And um, it wasn't really clear if the company was doing anything about it. And she was also told like, oh, this is really hard. We don't know what to do. And because she was so frustrated uh, and felt like she was being stonewalled, she protested in the canteen of the company and then published a, a long account of what happened on that business trip, accusing um, a supervisor of sexual assault, even rape, um, and also noting the client sexually assaulted her. Um, so it's because there wasn't an effective system in place that she had to um, protest in this very big way. Um, but she is now being sued for defamation by, I believe, two different people now. Um, so you know, this, so, so that, this is not a good way for this case to go. If there was a sexual harassment system in place that was formal, um, she could make a complaint, a, a, a team would investigate the complaint, and then a team would assess the evidence in that complaint and then come to a decision. That would be a, a much uh, better way for this case to be handled. But that wasn't in place in, at Alibaba, it seems, even though the civil code had already gone into effect saying that companies have this obligation. It seems like Alibaba you know, didn't know or did not care. Um, that's because they have no uh, incentive really to adopt a sexual harassment uh, system until this massive scandal happened. And, and now I hear that they actually have uh, proceeded with implementing a system. Um, so instead of waiting for a scandal to erupt, um, uh, I, I think also scandals are, don't necessarily lead to change and might lead to the company saying, yes, yes, we will do something, but then the public outrage goes away and then nothing happens. Um, I, I think a more powerful way of incentivizing companies to act now and comply with the law is to allow survivors to sue organizations that do not meet their duty. So um, taking the Alibaba case, for example, uh, I believe that the law uh, should have given the female employee the right to say, Alibaba, you do not have an anti-sexual harassment system in place. 
you should be held liable for the sexual harassment incident that happened. Um, uh, and this is actually a complicated question of how liable should they be. Um, that's a whole other discussion. Um, but at least to be able to bring a case uh, and put more pressure on companies. So you know they know that if they don't have a system in place, they risk legal liability. That would be um, uh, a way to apply more pressure. And right now that pressure doesn't really exist. The civil code uh, lays out the duty for employers, but doesn't say what consequences they may might face. And there's a big discussion on whether or not female employees, not all employees could bring a suit against their employer. And a lot of scholars say, no, um, uh, this is a very complicated question. Uh, the law should spell it out more clearly. Um, the, uh, the revised draft of the law on the protection of the rights and interests of women, um, they, that, that draft, those revisions um, provide some more incentives for employers to adopt anti-sexual harassment systems. So that, those revisions are good for saying more clearly that employers have this duty and that, that those revisions describe what companies should be doing. But when it comes to consequences, the consequences are also kind of light. Um, so like a, a, a regulator, a government regulator, if they see that a company does not have um, the sexual harassment uh, 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 system, anti-sexual harassment system in place, the regulator can demand that the, the company comply. And then if they don't comply, they can punish an individual manager who refused to comply. But that's kind of like having two bites at the apple. A company can just wait around until it gets caught. And then if it gets caught, it says, okay, okay, okay. Now we'll implement the policy. And if they do that, then they won't be punished. So uh, how much time does uh, uh, do government regulators have to go around to all the companies in China looking around? It, not a lot. So really you can just wait till you get caught if you're a company. Um, and the, these draft revisions also allow the, um, the procurat procurator, uh, prosecutors to bring public interest litigation against companies where the interests of many people are involved, many women are involved, and the circumstances are very, very bad. Um, uh, so that, that is an enforcement mechanism, but it also depends on the procurator, the procurator to have enough time, enough resources, and it's only when the things, circumstances are really, really bad will it act. And the procurator also already has like a lot of different things to do, bring criminal cases, bring environmental public litigation cases. Um, it's also, it also depends on their bandwidth. Um, I think a much more effective mechanism is to put the hand, the, put the tool of the law in the hands of all employees who can bring civil litigation if the company's duty um, is uh, not met. Um, and this is like a really complicated topic uh, in terms of when, you know, how much an employer should be held liable and what circumstances um, perhaps could be the subject of another uh, lecture. If I'm ever invited back after having such a long lecture, I'm so sorry, we're almost done. So, so the one last uh, uh, suggestion I think uh, would be good is for the law to explicitly say that employees who make a sexual harassment claim internally in their company, they are immune from defamation litigation. Um, they can make the complaint to trigger the investigation process. And then the company can make the determination. Um, if they are not protected, uh, then that employee might be really afraid of making the complaint because as soon as they make the complaint, to a group of people, um, that might count as defamation. And then, uh, you know, before any evidence is gathered, um, they might have already opened themselves up to a uh, defamation claim. Um, and that would have, a, I think, a, a big chilling effect on, uh, on sexual harassment cl complaints to be, um, uh, to be made. So it'd be really great if the law could say, in this circumstance, this does not count as publishing a statement. This is making a complaint to a select group of people who are the anti-sexual harassment like officers in the company, like HR. Um, that is immune from a defamation claim. 
I think that would be very helpful. Okay, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, if you're still here, I totally understand for the folks who went to bed uh, or want to go uh, clean the apartment or go on with their nights. Um, uh, to those folks who are still here, thank you so much for remaining. I look forward to having more of a discussion Just getting rid of that rule that says automatically the court cannot believe a party statement to establish a fact if that is the only evidence available. Maybe give courts that option and see if they see if they use it. Um, obviously, they still have those institutional constraints and pressures on them about time, about getting it overturned. Um, but maybe in some circumstances, um, like that court uh, for the case in the storage room. Um, they will actually believe the party making the sexual harassment claim, um, and and uh, and and I believe in and that that initial judgment, the local level, was appealed and it survived at that level too. So you know, cases just based on testimony won't necessarily get overturned on appeal. So maybe let's a way to explore would be to let the courts have that option and then. After a couple of years, we'll see the kind of cases that happen, and that might create more confidence in the system that um, this is possible. Um, the parts about allowing uh, employees to sue their employers for not um, for not uh, adopting sexual harassment systems or for implementing their systems poorly, um, I think that's possible. It's it's more there might be some sort of like economic sort of like policymakers might be worried like, oh no, this will open up companies to all sorts of litigation and will like hurt the economy. Um, sexual harassment also hurts the economy. Um, uh, and it hurts, it hurts women's participation in the workforce. Um, it causes all sorts of conflict. Um, so, you know, there's a strong economic argument that having sexual harassment policies on the books and implementing them um, is good for businesses and good for the economy. So on the whole, on the net, um, allowing employees to sue their employers for failing to implement their duty is good, is good for the economy. So I think, I think that can be done. Uh, and uh, the policymakers just need to sort of open the door more. Um, the revisions to the law on the rights and the protection of the rights and interests of women. Um, uh, it's sort of opening the door a little bit more, but not, not a lot. It'd be good if over time the door gets more and more open as opposed to getting stuck somewhere. Um, so, so don't give up hope. I think there's, um, you know, there's, there, there, there can be more done uh, in the future. And the more cases that are brought and the more these cases are talked about, and policymakers know about them, maybe the more calm they will feel about opening up the door. Yeah. Uh, in the US, employers have an affirmative defense <clears throat> to say, okay, yes, the sexual harassment did occur. And, and this is, this is they're very different systems, civil law versus common law. Um, the, in the US, um, sexual harassment, this term refers to anti-discrimination law. It's considered a form of gender discrimination uh, in the workplace or in educational settings um, for instances of like sexual assault or like unwanted touching. That is, a, a, you know, that is also against the law and harassers can be found liable for that and have to pay money for that. But that, that happens under a different um, a set of principles that's not anti-discrimination law. Like if, if you're on the street and somebody assaults you, um, that would not be an anti-discrimination law. This, uh, but, but for workplace sexual harassment, when you go after the employer, that falls into anti-discrimination law. So these things are, are very different. But I think there's this question that is shared, which is um, the principal agent relationship. And uh, this is, I have a whole other lecture about this. Um, so, uh, you know, we can, we can talk about this another time if I'm ever invited back. Uh, the idea, you know, 
the employer is the principal. The employee is the agent. Under what circumstances do the actions of the agent uh, redound to the, uh, to the, to the principal? So if, if the agent commits a tort, under what circumstances uh, is the employer liable for that tort? So there's this concept uh, in tort law or across the world um, uh, where if the uh, act is done in the course of um, the agent performing their duties. Um, so classic example is if the, the agent is driving a truck for, um, uh, for business and crashes uh, the truck through negligence, the people who suffer from that uh, accident can sue uh, the employer. Um, uh, but if the agent goes off on a frolic, doesn't mean completely, let's say the agent like takes the truck and goes on a joyride just for fun somewhere and then and gets drunk and then crashes, crashes the, um, uh, the truck, then, then it's more complicated because it's, it's not in the course of duty. Um, but maybe you could say the employer should have screened their drivers better. You get a whole other sort of bunch of questions on that. So, so the question is, you know, is when sexual harassment is committed by an employee, is that considered in the course of, uh, of, of performing their duties? And um, people say, like, no, um, it does not. Other people have argued that, no, it does. Because <laughs> uh, it's sort of their, um, it is, the, it's, it's while they're working that they're doing this. Um, or you can say, especially when, it, when a supervisor harasses somebody under them, the, the supervisee, the person under them, they know that supervisor has a lot of power. And that power comes from the employer. So they, they're sort of like a, a threat that if you don't agree to have sex with the supervisor or, or you speak up about the harassment, that that supervisor can retaliate against you. And the reason why that is more intimidating is because they have the power of the employer behind them. So maybe the employer should have li liability when a supervisor, um, um, uh, and, that, and, and, that is, and that is the case in the US. So if it's a supervisor, um, um, uh, let's say like just, um, it harasses the employee, um, the, the, uh, the employee can sue the, the, the company. And the, the company will be held liable unless they can use their affirmative defense. And that affirmative defense is, we have a sexual harassment system in place and we implemented that sexual harassment system. So we did our, we did our duty. Um, uh, I'll stop here. That was already a super long response to the question because it's, it's, it, is, it is very um, complicated. But I, I think something like that in China would be good to say that like, the, the, the company can have an affirmative defense. Um, it should be held, the company should be held uh, jointly liable unless they can present the affirmative defense or something you can call something different maybe, um, uh, that they have a policy on the books and they implement that policy well in this circumstance. Um, but this is, like a, this is like an interesting tort law question about principal and agent um, that we can talk about more another time. Uh, very good question. Yes, yeah, so the civil code seems to say that because it, it limits um, uh, the examples it gives are about uh, supervisor and supervisee, a vertical power relationship. And that, uh, that comports with the general principles of, of tort law that in this, in this principal agent relationship, the supervisor, um, as I just said, has the sort of power of the employer behind them. So uh, you, can, you can make a, a stronger argument that the employer should be responsible for this behavior. But if a colleague um, harasses another colleague and they have a horizontal power relationship, then there's a weaker argument that um, the, the, man, the, the, the harasser um, had the power of the employer behind them and harassing them. Um, 
in the US, we, we sometimes call these like, a, this leads to what we call um, hostile work environment cases. So in these cases, um, the court asked the question, was the harassment by the horizontal employees so bad that it created a hostile work environment um, and the employer knew or should have known that this was going on? And if they didn't do anything about it, they should be held liable for, um, for this harassment that's happening. It seems like the Civil Code Article 1010 um, doesn't apply to the situation. It only applies to this situation um, where the supervisor has the power of the employer behind them and is, is doing the harassment. And even then it doesn't say that you can, you can sue. It's sort of, that's sort of a, it doesn't clearly state that. The, the first part of that article clearly states civil liability for harassers, but the second part doesn't say civil liability for employers. Um, um, so, you know, it, 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 so it doesn't even state that this is a situation in, which uh, a lawsuit can be brought. Um, I just want to note that in the United States, um, this hostile work environment theory, this wasn't inevitable. There, there were other theories that were out there that were even sort of you know, broader that would allow for more liability of the employer. Uh, there's, a, there's this theory that it's, it's called like, like, I forgot, it's like risk creation th theory where the idea is if the employer starts a business and that business creates certain risks in the community, they should be held liable for any sort of damage that happens that come out of those risks. So if you hire a bunch of people, put them in a place, force them to work together, you're creating a risk of sexual harassment. And if sexual harassment occurs, you should be held liable uh, for that risk. So that even applies to horizontal power relationships harassment. Um, and you know, we'll give you an affirmative defense in that circumstance to say that you, you did your best to stop that from happening. Um, there's an interesting case in the United States involving a US Navy base um, involving uh, drunken sailors. Um, and in this case, the, the, the Navy base in, in America, maybe this is true in China too, sailors are very famous for getting drunk uh, when they are not on their ship, uh, when they're in port <laughs> uh, in the town, they're, they're famous for drinking a lot. So in this case, um, the, the, the sailors get drunk and they cause a lot of damage uh, in the surrounding town. And the court said, uh, there's a principal agent relationship between the Navy base and the sailors. Even though this is not in the course of the sailors duties to go out in the town and get drunk and start trouble. Um, but it's very, very predictable that this would happen. It's completely predictable that sailors would come to port, they get drunk, and they would make a lot of trouble. So the US Navy base should be held responsible for the damage caused by those sailors. And um, there's a theory about sexual harassment that this is predictable. It's predictable for a company when they start a business, they, um, they force a bunch of people to work closely together. Sexual harassment is going to happen, and they should be responsible for stopping it. And that would be even even broader theory um, for um, for finding liability for employers. That is not the theory used in the United States right now, um, but uh, judges have uh, raised that theory. Um, so um, you know maybe China can use that theory uh, or a theory like that in the future. Um, yeah, so this is also this is extremely difficult. This is like a huge like systems question. And like, because uh, um, it's, it's like, a, it's a puzzle that has like a lot of interlocking parts. So, you know, it's easy for me to an academic, you know, in my office, like far away to say, oh, this should change. Um, but what I'm suggesting is like the changing of a massive bureaucracy uh, that has like budget constraints, um, uh, time constraints, political constraints, like it ha has all these constraints on it. And those things are all connected together. And uh, you know, making space for my suggestion about believing party testimony would actually take, you know, it's not like flicking a switch, it would take changing all these interlocking parts a little bit to create more room. Um, and the, the US system is just very uh, uh, different. Like, so the, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity uh, Commission, uh, when it comes to complaints of discrimination, 
of which sexual harassment uh, claims are part of. Um, the system is that this administrative agency um, uh, this first will receive the complaints before the, um, the complaining employee has a right to go sue their employer. And this uh, equal employment opportunity, the EEOC, excuse me, they receive you know, thousands upon thousands of complaints of, about uh, discrimination, um, including thousands of complaints about sexual harassment from the workplace. I, I think it's like last year was maybe 6,000, 7,000 complaints. Um, and the US is you know, uh, uh, much smaller than China. Um, it's only a, a fourth of the size population-wise of China. Um, so uh, the EEOC, before these complaints can even get to court, the EEOC kind of acts as a, as a processing mechanism to uh, either help the parties mediate a settlement. Um, uh, uh, and if that doesn't work, they, they will then say, okay, uh, you can go sue your uh, employer. So it's sort of like a filter um, that, 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 that sort of reduces the burden on the courts. Um, the US justice system is also very slow. Uh, you know, so, so, so it's not necessarily the US justice system. Like, I, I think there's US trials, uh, there will be a lot more testimony, there'll be a lot more cross examination, um, but that all takes a much longer time. And the sort of lead up to cases, uh, that'll also take a lot of time. The, the pre trial hearings, um, uh, if you think about the Richard Leo case the, from JD.com, um, that case was filed you know, a couple of years ago, but it will only be heard uh, later this year, maybe if they, if they, don't, if they don't settle. Because um, there's, there's a ton of motions that uh, the parties can make to delay the hearing, to, to, to uh, do all sorts of things um, that really slow down the process. And that, but that does create, that creates more time for settlement to be reached. So it's, it's, and most cases get settled out of court. So it's, it's, it's really this, this battle of uh, assessing your, your risk, your chances of success um, before a trial, um, which won't happen for a long time. Um, so the, uh, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just a very, the sort of institutional setup of the, of the US system is different. And also the way litigation happens is different. And in, in many senses, it's, it has its own big drawbacks, which is long, long uh, delays. Um, where um, in Chinese civil litigation, in non-sensitive, non-politically sensitive cases, um, uh, litigation can happen pretty quickly. It sort of gets processed very quickly. Uh, although the, then that means, like I said, the depth of the investigation of, in the case isn't as much. Excellent question. And this is when I embarrassingly admit that we did not um, break it down by province or city. Um, we, we want to do that in the future, <laughs> but uh, we didn't do it yet. We were also thinking about breaking it down by trying to guess like the gender of the judges or like or looking up the gender of the judges. I think that's another important um, uh, factor to, to look at. Um, uh, but we haven't done that yet. Um, so thank you for reminding us and putting the pressure back on to, to do that. Um, my, I, I, was, I had a similar intuition that like, oh, maybe it's the courts in like Beijing and Shanghai that'll, um, that'll be more quote unquote progressive uh, on, on this issue. Um, but I, f I felt like um, it was surprising. Like it, it wasn't that there were places that you're like, oh, like, I, like that place, is not a first tier city, but the court had a pretty good, um, pretty good and well reasoned judgment. Um, so, like the the case involving the storage room was in uh, Dongguan, and that, that is still you know um, that is uh, you know per per Pearl River Delta, uh, like a lot of businesses, a lot of factories are, are there, but it's it's not a um, a first tier city. Um, and the other case that I liked involving, <clears throat> I thought the reasoning was pretty good. Uh, where was this? 
Okay, this is oh, that was the high people's court of Guangdong. Okay, so that that would that would comport with your theory as well. Okay, I, yeah, I really have to look into this question. I don't have a good um, uh, conclusion yet or preliminary guess yet. Mm, sure, totally, you're totally right. These things do affect the outcomes of cases. Um, so let's first start with um, sort of non-politically sensitive cases, cases that don't involve parties who are um, politically connected or famous. Um, let's let's start discussing um, cases uh, that um, involve yeah non-famous people who don't have political power. Um, <clears throat> totally that judges' perspectives on gender and their, their values and their, their conservatism or their mis misogyny, um, uh, these can all play a role. Um, and that's why I think it's really important to like sort of look at the, what we have to do in the future, like the, the gender and the age of different judges. Because um, in the cases that I mentioned, uh, I, I think this is highlighted in the cases that I mentioned that involve like uh, text or recording evidence where, um, it's established that a certain behavior happened, but then it's interpretation of that behavior. So if the, if the judge says, oh, you know, maybe that male employee did touch the rear end of the female employee, but you shouldn't be fired for that. That's, that's not a big deal. You know, that, that, that sort of, that shows, shows like the judge's attitude. Um, uh, and it, I, I'm assuming the person who said that is a man. Um, I might be wrong about that, um, but uh, but whether it's a man or a woman, it's a sort of um, it's a sort of misogynistic attitude that the female employee should just deal with it, and uh, the the male employee should not be um, should not be disciplined for that. Um, or the case where the manager asked the female employee to sleep with a client, and the court in that case said, "Oh, you know that's inappropriate, but you should be fired for that. That's not a big deal. Um, I, I, that's that's a certain worldview that uh, puts women in, in an unequal position. Um, it's it's discriminatory against women. Um, that is a problem, um, and that can be dealt. I mean, huge societal change is a massive topic, um, and I and there there are activists and um, um, who are much better than." Uh, me at, at sort of discussing this, but it, it's a huge problem. And it also exists in the United States. The Amber Heard and Johnny Depp case that happened recently was a terrible example of, uh, of juries um, siding with uh, who I believe is the abuser in the situation. Uh, uh, Johnny Depp is rich, he's famous, and uh, he and his lawyer team used an incredible amount of resources to sort of win public opinion uh, onto his side and, um, and he successfully sued um, uh, Amber Heard uh, for millions of dollars in defamation for, um, for saying that she's a, a victim of domestic uh, violence. And this reflects a very bad thing that is happening in the United States right now, which is like this counter revolution against feminism. Um, uh, is a big sort of, the right in America right now is, is very sort of resurgent. Um, so, you know, it's not like the U.S. has like fixed these problems, like the, uh, the uh, these sort of uh, misogynistic attitudes also appear um, in civil litigation in the United States, and that, that might be even more true because of the presence of juries. Um, so, uh, so, um, but back to China, having more female judges, having better sort of gender perspectives and legal education to talk about these things. and. Uh, I think could help in the future for having fair judgments. Um, moving to the politically sensitive cases, um, this does happen too. I think um, in politically sensitive cases involving powerful people, um, courts might behave strangely. Um, I think the most clear example of this recently is in the case against uh, Zhu Jun, the CCTV host star. The court, um, uh, made strange decisions. So for example, um, the plaintiff in that case, Sienzi, she requested to recategorize the case from general personality rights to um, sexual harassment dispute. That's because 
after she brought the case, the Supreme People's Court created a new cause of action. That cause of action is sexual harassment disputes, which is a kind of general personality rights dispute. It kind of made a more specific cause of action for the specific kind of case. Usually, um, you can make that request and it, it, will be, it will be honored. The court will say, okay, yeah, this does fit into this other cause of action better. So we'll make that change. Um, but according to uh, the plaintiff, Sienza in that case, that request was made and the court said, no, um, sexual harassment disputes, this kind of cause of action only applies to sexual harassment incidences that happen in schools, happen in educational settings. That's not true. <laughs> so, so that's, that, that's, that's, that was a weird uh, response. So I, I, I don't have any evidence of this, but it seems like the court is not making that decision based on the law, but is making a decision based on other reasons. Um, and it's kind of coming up with weird excuses about why, why I cannot recategorize the case. So I think when you get into, um, into, uh, into sensitive cases, then, then pressure can start to make things look, behave weirdly. Um, and the, in the US, like in the Johnny Depp case, like this, this, that was not achieved. Johnny Depp did not achieve the result through political power, but through money and fame and was able to sort of manipulate public opinion and thus the sort of perspectives of the jury um, uh, through other means. So there's other ways of influencing the uh, just uh, uh, nature of the outcome. Thank you so much. That it's uh, so important and it's so challenging and difficult in, this, in the current uh, political context given censorship um, and just the sort of online um, uh, discourse, the nature of online discourse right now is um, extremely, on the whole, seems to be extremely anti-feminist um, and uh, leads to a lot of online violence, bullying, and uh, you know the, the, the the censorship apparatus also uh, sort of uh, makes that debate very one-sided where the anti-feminist voices are sort of raised up and the feminist voices are, are more repressed. Um, uh, um, just to go back to the, the, the first point about the gender perspective of judges, I, I, I will definitely go back <laughs> and uh, you know try to get that information for these case sets. And I hope in the future to continue doing this research to kind of build a database of more cases over more years. Um, you know, this is published in The Diplomat, which is just kind of like an online magazine. Um, but the hope is eventually to keep on adding to this and have a more robust um, uh, set of data where we will look at things like gender and age and education and um, <clears throat> to see if there's what, what kind of correlations, what kind of relationships there are between the judge and how, how they rule. Uh, and it, it's my hope that, you know, younger judges, uh, more diverse sets of judges will have um, uh, uh, better understandings of how sexual harassment operates, how um, it infringes the rights of women, it creates more inequality in society, and they'll have more uh, progressive uh, and, and fair judgments. Um, but the, 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 there's this really difficult um, question that you raised in the second part of your question, how to create change when uh, there are so much pressure uh, to maintain the status quo or even uh, roll back changes that have been made. Um, like and those pressures are like censorship, uh, re state repression, um, and, uh, and this, uh, you know, this sort of raising up of very um, uh, anti-feminist uh, voices on, on, on social media. Um, there's an interesting dynamic going on where like, and, and what, this is like, this is one part of the story. The other part of the story is that the, the state, the government is making these like incremental changes to the law to say, yes, we think this is a problem. Sexual harassment exists. So we're gonna add an article in the civil code. This sort of reacting to me too, uh, and showing that we, we're doing something about it. Um, provision the civil code, the new cause of action in the, in the list of the Supreme People's Court's causes of action on sexual harassment, 
um, revisions to the law on the protection of the rights and interests of women. There's like, there's like these steps being taken to, um, uh, to say we're doing something, um, but they haven't, uh, they haven't really given sh sharp teeth to the law yet. It's more just showing like a, a direction of travel, but uh, I'm mixing metaphors. Like the teeth are growing, but they're not sharp yet. Maybe they <laughs> like um, the the government can still do more in terms of reforming the law to actually like balance out the playing field. Um, but the question is like, will there be enough pressure on them to do that? If with the other hand, they're sort of stopping activism from taking place. So activists have a really tough dilemma where um, they need to somehow uh, keep pressure on policymakers to keep raising this issue. And I think there are sympathetic people within the government on this issue. I think, I think there are sympathetic people throughout the system in different places in um, uh, like in uh, the All China Federation of Trade Unions, um, like in Workers Daily, you'll see articles um, as well as uh, in Fulian, the Women's Federation, uh, in the, the China Women's Daily, you'll see articles that um, are really advocating for uh, employers to have liability if they do not put in a robust sexual anti-sexual harassment system. So it seems like they're ahead of things. They, they, they want to push further on this. Um, but the law, uh, which is probably the result of much more compromise, is further behind. Um, so activists sort of need to sort of keep the pressure up on, um, on, on the system without triggering a backlash, um, that is a really hard thing to do. Um, uh, and it's not fair. I'm not saying like it's the activist's fault. Like it's, it's just the dilemma that they are being put into. Um, and I gotta say like the, the, a lot of the commentary on Weibo, like the anti-feminist commentary um, is like, out of control like like it's just uh like some of the comments i've seen are really um really uh extreme uh even things like accusing the women's federation of being uh somehow like seditious uh uh like a traitor to the country it's very it's, it's a lot so it's a really an um it's really hostile like information environment right now so i'm sorry i don't have any really good or any remotely good suggestions, but it's, it's, it's a real uh, dilemma.